It's official, Epiphany Lutheran Preschool and School are back in session. The classrooms and halls are once again filled with joyful laughter, bright smiles, and eager spirits, signaling the start of a new year of learning and growth. Welcome back, everyone. Here's to a full year of engaging and enriching experiences. We are so excited to see what this school year holds. Do I think these new teachers will work out? Yes, we've got an awesome team and they are awesome. They help us engage, encourage, and enrich. Oh, what's a new teacher's favorite snack? Yellow jello. This year's confirmation class for sixth through eighth graders begins on Wednesday, September 11th from 6 to 7 p.m. Dinner will be provided before class starting at 5.15. After dinner, all sixth and seventh graders will meet in the activity room and the eighth graders will meet in the church conference room. I have Mike Marcus, our congregational chairman, who wants to make a quick announcement. Very quick. Uh, next Sunday, after this service, there will be a very short voters' assembly. Uh, it's, made, it's only two things on the agenda. One is to call Michael Poop, one of the new teachers, into his position here. And the other is to elect Susan Grog as a secretary for the congregation. That's it. Shouldn't it take but five, ten minutes. If everybody gets together, we get started, we do, do it, and we'll be done. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, glad to have you all here today. Uh, let's rise and let's worship together.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. We confess, O Lord, that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Our own attempts at change will believe the stain of our previous sins. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Lord our God, you are our only hope. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we follow your guidance alone. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. We come to you confident of your mercy for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And instead of by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Restore me to the joy of your salvation. Amen. O me with a willing spirit. In peace let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy upon us, and help us to know your gracious forgiveness. For the peace from above for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy upon us and open the hearts of those oppressed by sin. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy on us and all who call on you in faith. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy upon us and grant us your peace permeate the lives of all who hear the gospel in this place. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also Let us pray. O God, the source of all that is just and good, nourish in us every virtue and bring to completion every good intent that we may grow in grace and bring forth the fruit of good works. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. Good morning. Good morning. The Old Testament reading comes from the fourth chapter of Deuteronomy, verses 1 through 2 and 6 through 9. Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the just decrees that I am teaching you, and do them that you may live and go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples, who, when they hear all the statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us, whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and just decrees so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? Only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading comes from the sixth chapter of Ephesians, verses 10 through 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, 
which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. This is the word of the Lord. Let us stand. Alleluia. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to to St. Mark, the seventh chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. This is nothing else, there is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated for the children's message. Y'all look really good today. Man, we've got some good-looking people here. Okay, I got something in this bag. Huh? It is not Kit Kats. I would urge you not to eat what I have in my bag. What do I have? Soap. Why do I have soap? What is the point of soap? To clean your hands? To clean your hair. To clean your hair. I would. And clean your body. And clean your body. It's good to be clean, isn't it? It's very good to be clean, isn't it? Like when you got up this morning to come to church, I'm pretty sure your mothers and fathers probably was checking your outfit, checking your hair, nope. making sure you're clean. <laughs> no? Nope. They trust you? Yeah. That's a good thing. Yeah. And you look good. Yeah. And you yeah. look clean. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so soap is important, okay. But what would happen, it's good to come to church clean, isn't it? Yeah, it's kind of a way that we tell God that we love him and, and we're in awe of him, and so we want to look our best. What would happen if we were coming to church and we slipped and fell into a big muddy puddle and got covered with dirt and we were no longer clean? Take you got to go home and take a bath? You can't come to church that way? I like that. Because does God care if you're dirty? He does. Does he care if you're dirty on the outside? No. No. He's more worried about inside. Will this soap help clean me inside? No. No. How does he clean the inside of our body? I'll give you a clue. Right? When we are baptized with water, then the inside of our body is clean, right? Yes, he did that too. Yeah. And when we come to communion and we take the body and the blood, and what do you get? Because you're too little to take communion yet. What do you get? That's right. 
And when we come to church, at the very beginning, we do something that cleans our inside. You know what we do? We have, we have confession. And that's where we say that we're sorry for the things that we did that we know aren't showing Jesus' love and for the things that we didn't do that we probably should have showed Jesus' love. And we do that together every Sunday. Do you, do you hear those words when you come to church? Maybe if you don't hear them, you need to pay attention to that at the very beginning when we confess our sin. And Jesus does this amazing thing. He cleans us over and over and over again every time we ask. That's some pretty good news, isn't it? Because every day I need him to clean my insides, right? Let's pray to God. Dear Father, thank you for giving us Jesus who continually cleans us in spite of the things we do. Help us to show Jesus' love every day and to humble ourselves Ask for your forgiveness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's go. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Our text from Mark chapter 7, we continue on through that that text. Um, It's funny. And he, Jesus, called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand there is nothing outside a person that by going at him can defile him. 
But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And those things that come out can also then enter into other people, and you know, it's just a mess. Um, let's pray. Grace say, Father, we thank you. We thank you and we praise you for, for doing what you did. Uh, there's a lot about us that, that, that we try to convince ourselves that we're really not as bad off as we, we sometimes hear that we are. And yet, when we think like that, we lose so much. We lose so much. Help us, Lord, to see ourselves in a proper light, the way that you see us. But help us also to see us in the way that you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. So, you got Mark's gospel is very unique. Mark's gospel, the tradition is, is that Peter kind of transcribed to Mark what to write. So, so Mark was interviewing Peter. And so it's interesting, when you look at this text... You see the word defile used there at least multiple times in this text. And then you see that something that's right there, that right before verse 20, thus he declared all foods clean. And you might remember when Peter saw the canopy of the animals in the book of Acts, and he was told by his heavenly father, it's okay to go to the Gentiles, it's okay to eat unclean food, and it's all connected. And so you can see Peter kind of coming out in this text a bit. What's really fascinating in this text is at the end of our text, we do what we always do. We said this is the gospel of the Lord. Gospel means good news. There is no good news in this. No good news. It, it is, it is it, it, Jesus calls the people to them, to them, okay? And all the people, same thing, all the people. And he tells them, here's the problem. The problem is your innards. The problem is you can't get rid of this. It's a problem. And now learning what we've learned with genetics, we've learned that every cell in your body carries your genetic code and all your, all your stuff. And so, you know, original sin is not something that, okay, original sin takes place in the heart. If we just cut out this little set, no, it's everywhere. How do we know it's everywhere? Because all of us are going to do one thing one day and it's something to look forward to and we're all going to die. We're all going to die. The Bible says the wage of sin is death. And so if you need any further evidence that we're a sinner, that's it. The Bible tells multiple times that this is a problem we got, and Jesus is very pungent here. He's not, he's not taking any of the blow away, and he's doing this out of love. This is not Jesus berating the people and, and going after the Pharisees. He cares enough to tell them, here's the real problem. You Pharisees, you think it's just, yeah, washing hands and what you do on the outside, but Jesus is saying the real problem's deeper. And he's a good doctor. He's not the doctor that, you know, I hear these, these doctors today that they don't want to they don't want to fat shame people or something like that. So people are going to doctors that won't do that. Well, if the doctor's not telling you that sometimes things in your life could be unhealthy, whether it's that or something else, then what, what good is the doctor in the long run? And sometimes the doctor has to be for it right. I had a doctor recently, who a nurse practitioner, she's not a doctor, but she sure acted like one. And she dug into me like nobody's business, and I sat there, I said, I got it. And, um, and I've been on a much better pill regimen than I've ever been because uh, I don't want to deal with her again. And, um, and, but I appreciate, I appreciate her. You know, I, I even paid for that. It's kind of weird. You know, it's like pay to get yourself beat up a bit. But, but that honesty is what you need. Because the last thing you want is, is like the old Americans, Americans Idol. Remember that old show long ago when, when it first started? You would have people that would get on the show and they would be horrible. And you'd watch it for that. Like, you watched it to see the train wreck. It was so interesting. And also to see Simon Cowell and how he would address this issue. But it was amazing how many people had never had somebody tell them, well, you're really not that good. It seems like along the way, everybody just, hey, you're the best ever. You're the best ever. Next thing you know, they get before a big audience to realize they ain't the best ever. And when they come to their grips, it's got to be horrifying. Because everybody along the way has just been, been trying to be helpful, but in the long run, not being helpful. Same thing in this world. One of my favorite songs growing up, I, one of my bands I like, they got only really four good songs, but one of them is called Follow Your Heart. It's a band called Triumph. And I always like this song. It's a, it's a good tune, and it kind of addresses a lot of the way the world thinks. But the Bible doesn't want you so much to follow your heart. The Bible wants you to instead ask for a clean heart. And different things. When our founding fathers created this great nation, 
They knew the potential for human power and, and the corruption of that power to happen. And so they built checks and balances. It's one of the things that makes our country so unique. And, and because we've got these, and sometimes the checks and balances get in the way of what you want to see done and all that. I get it. But the checks and balances are there to make sure, hopefully, that someone won't just come in and be a dictator or worse yet, a king, much like our founding fathers were leaving. And they took human nature seriously. They realized that people are not basically good, but people have this basic propensity toward evil. And I know that that's not a popular teaching today. People today, they go, oh, that sounds horrible. You know what's horrible? It's when you put your trust in people only to realize that what Jesus is saying is true. When you put your trust in people and all of a sudden the disappointment comes. And you act, whoa, well, lo and behold, I'm so surprised. And yet Jesus warned you. He said, this is the way it is. The hearts of all people are, are, are defiled. They're evil. All of us have this thing stirring in us. It's called original sin in theology, but it's this thing that Jesus talks about, and it shows itself in selfishness. What's in it for me? How can I protect myself? How can I make myself look better? At the heart of all sins we do, that's what's there. And that's, it's not that we sin and become sinners. No, no, no. We are sinners because, well, we're sinners. We have a problem going all the way back to Adam and Eve. And Jesus is being very kind here, even though it doesn't seem so at first. He's saying, this is a problem you're not going to be able to solve. You're not going to go to the library and pull out some help book or maybe two health books and find a way out of this. You're not going to be overconsumed with what you need to do to get to where you need to be, which a lot of people think is where you need to spend your energy because Jesus is very, very blunt. Nothing you can do will get you to where you need to be. Nothing. You're defiled within. You got a huge problem. And that problem shows itself in verse 21. It shows itself in evil thoughts. <laughs> Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. These are things our culture is trying to celebrate rather than exonerate. These are things our culture is trying to push up and say, it's not so bad. Because our culture has learned you can't get rid of these things. But our culture doesn't know that the real problem is deeper than just the doing or not doing of these things. It's the fact that we'll never be able to do these things perfectly. Or we'll always fall into these things at all times. Jesus is kind enough to say what it really is. The Pharisees, they thought they were being kind, but they weren't. They, were, they, they, they didn't really get what was at the heart of the problem. It wasn't following traditions of men and trying to you know, make yourself holy and before other people and God. It was coming to God and saying, I'm not holy. I need you. It's different. Different. And how you view human nature will dictate how you do a lot of things in life. I basically think that all people are selfish. But I don't sit in a negative universe because I know that the selfless God continues to intervene in this world. And so in the midst of knowing that everyone is selfishness, myself included, I also keep my eyes open for signs of God working his selflessness around me working his servitude around me and showing me that people can be bigger than what I think they should be or even what God says they are because of Jesus, because he sends his spirit into this world. We're not alone. We're not, we're not wandering around with a story of Jesus and saying, oh, I want to do this now, I want to do this. Oh, what did he do again? We have been given the Holy Spirit to help us, to help us do what we could not do and we're under an obligation to follow Jesus, but even we will fail at that. And God is kind enough to make his forgiveness big enough for all of that. This is the beauty of what God has done. He's, 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 he's dictated what the problem is, and then he came himself and took care of the problem. And it cost him. It cost him his life. Like, like, this is great love. No other love like this. He defiled himself 
so that we could be clean. And I know in this world, even though we've been baptized and we've been made new, maybe to the world around us, we don't look like the cleanest at times as we do our infighting or whatever we do. Our divorce rate in churches is not much greater than the divorce rate outside of the church, I'm going to be honest with you. It's not like we've got everything figured out. But it's the quiet realization that we don't have to have it all figured out because he has. And when he died on that cross, he took everything. See, there's no gospel in this text, but the gospel actually is the one saying the text. And that can't be overlooked. The one who's saying these pungent words is the one himself who came. He had none of those things in verse 21, but he wore all of them like a terrible robe on that cross. And how do we know he did that? Because three days later, he rose again from the dead. And by rising again, what it shows is that Jesus fulfilled all the promises of God. It showed that when he said you are forgiven, you are actually forgiven. Even for those things that you don't know stir in the hearts of man, those are forgiven. And not only that, you have eternal salvation. Not as some thing you're still working toward, but that all comes together when you get the forgiveness, the salvation. And what's the point of that? You know what? Now those self-help books in the shelves of the library, they're not all that interesting because you've got better than self-help. You've got a live help. You've got one who comes to you at all times through his holy word, through the waters of baptism, through the wine and bread we celebrated earlier this morning, and God assures you that I am with you, that I love you, and as repulsive as you can be at times, I've got you. I've got you. And so defiled you may be, but holy you are. And not because of something you've done, not because of your hard work, not because of your church attendance, your giving, or anything to do with what you do, but solely and only because of the one who's speaking, Jesus Christ. And so on that, enjoy this world. Enjoy this world as you look at people and you realize, you know what? People have the same bad heart that I got, and they will let me down. But I'm going to forgive them because the one who forgives me has forgiven stuff that they will never know about. And if he's willing to forgive me, guess what? And so it all works out how you view people. If you view people, though, as basically good, you're not going to like my preaching. You're not going to like much about me, to be honest with you. It's that serious a problem when you start to look at human nature like that. Because I'm telling you that you need Jesus. And if you think that you got some good in you, guess what? You just got rid of a need. Let that never happen to you. As we come together, let's rejoice that we confess our sinfulness before God and one another. Let's rejoice that he forgives us. Let's rejoice when the pastor seems to be meddling into our sinfulness and touching things that we would rather have him not touch. Be grateful for a God who cares so much about you as he cared so much about people back then. He loves you. He doesn't just speak words, but he did the action. Oh, did he do it. Amen. Let's pray. Grace, Holy Father, we thank you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his holy love. May you bless us and bless our day. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us rise and let us join together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. Please be seated. We now worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings. If you have any prayer requests, please use one of the forms you can find in the back of the church and include them in the offerings as they're gathered. Thank you.
Thank you, Pam. This prayer time at Epiphany. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we offer before you our common supplications for the well-being of your church throughout the world. So guide and govern all who profess themselves Christians to live as servants for Jesus' sake. Enable us to not only profess grace and mercy, but help us also live in such a way that reveals Jesus to others. Heal our land and empower our leaders to lead with humility, wisdom, justice, and compassion. As we journey through this world, we humbly ask your abiding presence in every situation that you would make known your ways among us. Preserve those who travel, satisfy the wants of your creatures, and help those who call upon you in any need. All whom we have listed now and all we give to you now from our hearts. That they may have patience in the midst of suffering and according to your will, be released from their afflictions through Christ Jesus, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.